Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'll be talking with Willie Delwich of All Star Charts. We'll talk about some of the charts that are helping him make sense of this market environment. I'll tell you what did not make sense of the open, but overall, things started to settle in. We'll talk about the S&P netting out to a zero for the day. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Welcome to our Tuesday show. Pleasure to have you with us uh, every weekday after the close. It is cloudy in here in uh, Redmond, Washington. Also cloudy in terms of the markets. A fascinating open, one of those structural issues, which, to be honest, we haven't had a lot of those where we have halted trading in some small unknown names like AT&T and Wells Fargo, um, and I say that with a great, uh, great deal of, uh, of sarcasm, uh, choppy open. And I think that was an unsettling uh, tape through the course of the day. At the end of the day, the S&P really directionally did not make any ground to the upside or the downside. Spent most of the day below yesterday's close, but no real significant uh, move. Ended up being a, a bit of a wash. What's interesting is the volatility continues to come down as measured by the VIX. We continue to see stocks that are, uh, that are setting up. But the question, as always, is do you have follow through? We'll look at the chart of the S&P 500, see if we've had enough of a follow through above that trend line resistance to declare with uh, absolute no issue a uh, breakout to the upside. I'm not sure if we can uh, do that yet. Let's get right to the market recap. So looking at our uh, our market dashboard here on stock charts, you can see the S&P just down about 0.1% around 4017. Yesterday's close right around 4020, so really no real move. Dow was up about a third of a percent, NASDAQ down about a third. Most indexes netted out to sort of a zero and unchanged for the day. The volatility uh, of the markets, and again, measured by the VIX, down uh, to just above 19. And could be an interesting uh, tell. One of the charts I like to look at is uh, high yield spreads, the VIX, and the S&P, because high yield spreads tend to narrow, volatility can tends to come down while stocks are rallying. In general, that's kind of the relationship, and it's played out pretty well here over the last month where we've seen spreads continue to come in, meaning high-yield investors are requiring less compensation for owning the debt of risky companies. Volatility has come in as the VIX has gone below 20, and the S&P, of course, has overall been uh, moving a little further to the upside. Interest rates overall moving down through the course of the day, 10-year uh, yield down uh, to three, uh, about 350, 347, we'll call it. Uh, bond prices, of course, up a little bit. The dollar index, not a big change from yesterday. But uh, again, as I was doing a, uh, a presentation earlier today, we talked a lot about the dollar, the trend in the dollar, um, and, and a huge reversal. I know my guest today, uh, Willie Dell, which will talk a little bit about the dollar and what that means for non-U.S. markets, which certainly has been a, a change of character in the last uh, couple months, to be to be clear. Commodities overall a little mixed. Uh, the GLD, uh, silver ETFs that we track, both positive for the day, not by much, but certainly pushing to the upside. That rally in gold has been an impressive uh, development here uh, starting in the fourth quarter. I mean, gold, again, with inflation being the main issue, if not one of the most significant issues in 2022, and gold essentially being a horrible trade for most of the year was sort of an interesting, uh, an interesting phenomenon. Of course, the stronger dollar sort of killed the uh, the gold chart. Now that's all changed. You're seeing the GLD rally. I'm finding stocks that I'm scanning for, stocks making new swing highs. I'm finding a lot in the material space, gold gold miners uh, and other mining stocks, uh, for example, as well. Some of the other areas of the commodity space down a bit. And the energy sector was down about a third of a percent. We'll get to sectors here in a minute. Bit of a choppiness, as always, with the cryptocurrency space. Bitcoin pushing just above 23,000 here before we went live. Uh, Ether down a little bit around 1620 from yesterday. If you missed yesterday's show, by the way, we dug a little bit into the charts of Bitcoin and Ethereum. Talked about that nice rotation. Again, my my uh, my my what I love about charting and technical analysis is the why as to why a chart starts to look bad or look or look good is irrelevant in a lot of ways, right? In terms of a pure technical read, it's about the charts and what they tell you about market conditions. And, and honestly, you were getting inside the head of all the different market participants. So when the chart of Bitcoin goes up, the chart doesn't care whether you think Bitcoin should go up or go down. 
it's going higher because there's more demand than supply, because there's more greed than fear, more buying power than selling pressure, or however you would define it. The price going up is probably the most bullish thing that you can see on the uh, on the chart. You're starting to see that with cryptocurrencies. Here's the chart of the S&P 500. I want to spend just a minute with this one. Yesterday, of course, we celebrated the fact that the S&P was above this trend line, this thick green trend line that I've made thicker and bolder through the course of the last six months because we keep testing it. Every time we test this trend line, for me, it once again reinforces what a, what a beautiful way it is to just visually track the pace of this downtrend. Now, when we make a big higher low like we did in December, clearly much higher than the October low, that's the beginning of something potentially super encouraging. Completing that rotation through that trend line resistance would be even better. Now, we closed through it yesterday. We closed back above it today. I think that might be enough of a follow through, although we haven't closed above yesterday's close just yet. It's a bit of a down day. So I'd love to see through the remainder of this week if we could continue to power through there. Now, we have a number of earnings going on, including some significant ones. Microsoft reporting after the close today. We have a number of the down members reporting this week. Uh, Tesla, IBM, both after the close tomorrow. Uh, Intel, a uh, bunch of the airlines. There's a, there are a number of uh, stocks, certainly with market moving potential, that will be reporting in the next uh, 48 hours. So I think still an open question mark. But if we can follow through that trend line, if we could get above 4,100, which would take us above the uh, December peak, if we could get the RSI in a positive phase, meaning getting above the uh, 60 level, that would, I think, complete this bullish rotation that we may have seen. Now, what's interesting is, as we're talking about this, looking at the uh, the Mindful Investor Live chart list, this is the breadth picture for uh, the markets. And as you can see, by the fact that I very subjectively color-coded them bright green, Pretty constructive, right? If you look, this is the advanced decline line for the New York Stock Exchange for large caps, mid caps, and small caps. While the S&P is still below its November peak, all four of these advanced decline lines have already made a new swing high, right? They've made a new high for this cycle off the October lows. And I think that's meaningful, right? Is it possible that the S&P stalls out and goes lower, even though all these advanced decline lines have already broken out? That is certainly possible. I don't want to say it's it's impossible. Is it probable, though? I would probably say not, because breadth tends to be a better indication of the underlying strength of the market. We have a market that has not been dominated by the mega cap sort of fang stocks or what I call the uh, the menomina stocks, those eight stocks that we've uh, that we've talked about before. Um, you know, those have not been the leadership overall. As a result, the breadth conditions have continued to improve while the chart of the S&P and the chart of the Nasdaq still waiting to uh, to break out. So while we haven't had a breakout in price, the, the, the indications that I would use to make sense of what's happened to stocks as the S&P is approaching that previous high, in my opinion, uh, overall, uh, looking up pretty constructive. Another way to measure this is looking at breadth in the form of the stocks above their moving averages. We can see we're at about 65% for the S&P 500 uh, versus their 200-day and 70% almost after today's bounce uh, and yesterday's bounce above their 50-day moving average. So stocks are in general above their moving averages, and they've held 50% when the market is pulled back. And I think that could be an interesting, uh, an interesting data point to pay attention to. If we would roll over, these hold 50%. Conditions are not getting that bad, despite what the indexes may look like. We get below 50%. All of a sudden, I think that starts to look a little bit more like a bearish cycle, and then we'd have to reevaluate it. But for now, again, I'm finding a lot to uh, to be, um, to be appreciate in terms of constructive developments. One final one, and then we'll look at some individual names here to finish off our market recap, is to tell you about offense over defense. I did a webcast earlier today for market misbehavior, and we were talking about this traditional measure of offense versus defense. You can do the XLY versus the XLP, which is basically consumer discretionary over consumer staples, right? Things you want versus things you need. The reason why this tends to work, because consumer discretionary, in general, these are discretionary purchases. Things like a new watch or nice clothes or new shoes or travel and tourism all fit into that uh, discretionary bucket. You don't need them necessarily today, but if you have the ability to get something that you want, you might do it. The staples are things that you're always going to need, right? The, the, no matter what is happening with inflation and other things, you're probably going to need toilet paper and beverages 
and alcohol and tobacco and household goods and cleaning products. And those are things that are sort of immune to what's going on around you as, a, as an investor, as a consumer. So as a result, if this ratio is going up and it's the equal weighted version at the bottom that I would pay attention to, the fact that this is broken out tells me on average, people are leaning into things that you want over things that you need. And maybe to be more accurate, the stock prices are reflecting the fact that investors, investors are showing confidence in the fact that uh, things you want are, are doing just fine relative to things you need. Overall, I found that to be a pretty constructive uh, signal. It broke down before the market did here in the fourth quarter of 2021. It bottomed out before the market did so far here in June of 2022. And now we're starting to see a breakout before the market has, uh, has done that as well. I see that as a bullish sign as well. So while I've been fairly bearish for the market on the last 12 months, it's becoming less and less easy to do so as we keep getting these signs that are rotating more positive than negative. By the way, I was looking at a chart of the SPY, 30 years old this month. I actually didn't realize it was January of uh, 93 when it was first uh, first released. Just to finish off our uh, market recap, I'm, I'm struck by names like PDD. This is one of the top 10 stocks in our large cap scooter rankings, despite what you may think about China and, and what the uh, outlook could or should be for that market, the influence of you know COVID restrictions and, and zero COVID and everything that has gone on all of the potential headwinds we've seen, the chart has just looked good for quite some time. And you've seen a series of pullbacks that have been higher dips, and then we rotate higher. And it feels like once again, we've pulled back to around 90 and we're rotating once again off of that level. I'm encouraged when I see a chart that continues to rotate higher instead of moving, uh, breaking down. And, and what's great is the chart like this will probably tell you when the trend is no longer in place because it will stop going up. And at this point, higher highs and higher lows still appear to be uh, in uh, in uh, in play. Finally, just to finish off, it was a crazy day, and these structural issues, like we saw this morning, a number of things. There was a with the opening price. There's a bit of an issue. So AT and T, Wells Fargo, a bunch of other ones. Uh, I was looking at these. Most likely will remain like this. That isn't an error, and those those trades actually appeared to have happened. So we can't really just clean those off. So I'll just get ahead of any questions you may have. I know we get questions on can we get rid of those and clean them up. You really can't. It's around the flash crash when we've had issues like that. They're there. And so what you have to do is just think about the bigger picture. But that's when I would say what's good about thinking about the trend over time and thinking about the close. The close appears to be pretty accurate in terms of where we uh, where we ended the day. I think that's fair. So recognizing that this is a crazy range that might skew some indicators like an average true range. It's just an acceptable issue with equities when there's a bit of, uh, of instability. But overall, it seems like we netted out in a good place. So watch for some of those patterns, which may be a little bit uh, not a reference to uh, you know market behavior, but more a uh, structural challenge earlier today. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with Willie Delwich of All Star Charts. We'll see you in a minute. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the final bar. It's such a pleasure to put the show on for you. And we appreciate you tuning in every weekday after the close. A couple quick announcements before we bring on today's guest. First off, we welcome your questions. We're going to do a mailbag segment at the end of this week, and we'd love to feature one of your questions live on the air. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV, and we are on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll hope to answer one of your questions on Friday's show of this week. Go to stockchartstv.com. That is our on-demand platform. Special events recently have included Larry Williams' Market Outlook. Martin Pring did a great Market Outlook with uh, Bruce Frazier. We had our 2023 Stock Charts Market Outlook with Miss Schneider, Tom Boley, and Greg Schnell. All of that and much, much more is available for free at stockchartstv.com. Or on your mobile device, just search for Stock Charts TV On Demand. Upcoming guests, I'm excited to talk to uh, Willie Delwich here in a few minutes. To uh, tomorrow on Wednesday, the 25th, we have Katie Stockton, founder of Fair Lead Strategies and manager of the TAC ETF, coming to us from Connecticut. On Thursday, the 26th, David Hunter, a true contrarian who tends to bring some aggressive targets for the S&P and other things, will be on the show on Thursday. Always a bit controversial, but entertaining to talk to. Next week, we have Sam Stovall on Fed Day on February 1st. That's gonna be, that'll be a good one to, uh, to tune into as we try to digest what we learned from the uh, Fed. Also, just a heads up, next Monday and Tuesday, we're going to be running the show a little bit late at 6 p.m. Eastern because we will be making some big improvements to our studio, which hopefully we will be in very, very soon. Excited to show the new uh, Stock Charts TV studio as soon as we can get it up and running. I want to welcome on today's guest, Willie Delwich. Willie is an investment strategist at All Star Charts, coming to us from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Willie, Happy New Year. Welcome back to the show. 
Uh, thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. So I appreciate you sending some uh, some charts with us. Obviously, we're sort of in the guts of earnings season. The S and P, the major averages, rallying pretty good uh, into the beginning of the new year. Talk us through this chart, which is helping us think about a little more of the uh, the headwinds and tailwinds to uh, to the market. What what are we seeing here? Yeah, sure. So so the the, the question that I, I kind of set out to answer with this chart is: Does it matter if we're above or below the two hundred day average? And and there's another chart that I did with that, and I said no, it doesn't matter. What does matter is whether or not the two hundred day average is rising or falling. And so in the chart here in the middle, we've got the S and P five hundred anchored it to. Um, 11998 because that's that's what we're looking at. And then, um, basically, if the 200-day moving average is rising, so above where it was 10 days ago, then we look at look at that line, and then we compare it versus what happens when the 200-day average is falling. And you go back 20 plus years, all of the net gains for the S&P 500 have come when the 200-day moving average has been rising. And so, yeah, we started off this year with a lot of strength. But it's it's all you could almost say it's a rally that's fighting the trend because mm -hmm. the trend is still lower. Um, it doesn't mean that it you know at some point you need a rally to get above the two hundred day average to take it to turn the average higher. But at this point, the trend is still lower for the S and P five hundred, even though we've kind of come out the gates really strong this year, which is encouraging and a relief over over what we saw last year. That's such a really good point and a great way of thinking about it, right? As much as we've rallied from the low in October, we still haven't really made it much above the 200-day moving average at all. And there's no way that slope's going to go up until we actually start to get above that, right? Um, so it's, it's right. Interesting, really, really interesting to frame it as a, as a counter turn rally. And just to be clear, because I think I, I love the way you set up this chart, Willie. This is basically the light blue on the top is just including the S&P returns if the uh, moving average is sloping higher. And that's why you have yeah. these flat lines, because basically, it, you know, in this case, it was sloping up. So you're sort of, you know, waiting for the next time that it's uh, that it's sloping downwards. So it's a great way of showing that differentiation between the two, I guess. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that's what it, it's two regimes. It's it's a binary or is is a 200 day average rising or is it falling? And and what happens in those different those different regimes? And and you also see over time, we usually have a rising 200 day average. Um, you know, and that's where you get a lot of the gains. It's rare to have a a 200 day average that's falling, but it also pays to to treat that with some caution. And, and I guess maybe the the final takeaway from it would be if we get to the point where the 200 day average is rising again, we've got time to lean in at that point. We don't need to call mm. the turn and anticipate the turn. We can wait for the trend to to actually give us a signal. Yeah, people get really scared at the beginning of a move that they're going to they're going to miss the whole thing and I think right. what you're showing is the annual returns when the the 200 days rising pretty decent, right? They're they're, yeah. they're bankable returns. Your second yeah. chart is getting to some of the the discussion of the dollar and non-US markets. Can you talk us through this one? Sure. So the the top line there that's just the the US dollar index. Um and then then the two lines at the bottom are the percentage of aqui markets. So that's all country world index. It's 47 um you know, global markets, some about half of them are emerging markets, half of them are developed markets. And um, looking at the percentage that are above their 50 day average, that's in orange, dark blue is percentage above their 200 day average. And um, really see the, you know, when when the dollar started to lose some of its strength, um, you know, in the second half of last year, that's when global markets really came alive. And you started to see, um, you saw hints of it earlier with the percentage of Markets above their 50 day average peaking and then falling, but really that sustained strength we've seen in terms of the percentage that are getting above their 200 day averages, that's really intensified as the dollar has has come off its high. And so mm. um, I, I don't know that we need the dollar to continue to weaken for the rest of the world to do well, but I would say the dollar being as strong as it was probably kind, kind of what, what kept the rest of the world down a little bit. Um, and so seeing some of that that pressure relieved, now we can start to talk about global diversification again, um, start to think about things outside of the U.S. where we're, you know, you know, talk about downtrends in the U.S. still outside the U.S. Acqui X U.S. is actually now in an uptrend. Um, mm -hmm. Mexico trading at its highest level since 2015. So lots of opportunity around the world for U.S. investors. It's just the question is, are they going to take advantage of that opportunity? Because we're not used to doing that from the perspective of a U.S. investor. 
Yeah, it's so funny because I feel like recently, and, and, and any newer investors, the idea of going outside the U.S. has just been a non-starter. Right? I mean, it's just, there's been no real reason to go outside when the U.S. markets are so much stronger. When, what, you know, How would you sort of encourage someone who's just getting started thinking about U.S. versus non-U.S. allocation? Is it a is it a currency bet? Are you looking at the dollar as your main thing? Is it more about making sure that your analytical process includes some things outside the U.S.? And if so, do you look at local indexes? Would you look at ETFs? Like, how would you coach someone who's not familiar with looking at these non-U.S. markets? Because the returns certainly appear to be there. Yeah. So a, a couple of things. One, I would start with just, you know, the ACWI. So that's kind of the global includes the world or includes the U.S. and the rest of the world. Um, that's about 60% U.S., 40% the rest of the world. So that should kind of be your base allocation. Mm. Um, and and then I, I think we can get mixed up a lot of times looking at local indexes, looking at currencies, um, you know, play it, play it via the U.S. ETFs. You're a U.S. investor, play it, play it via the ETFs, look, look at the, those for strength um, and, and not be afraid to to lean into areas where you're seeing strength, even if you're not accustomed to seeing strength there. And so um, I think one of the interesting things right now is for, for so long, any any international exposure people have wanted, it's been, it's like barbell, US and emerging market. Mm. What we've seen, right? what we're seeing right now is that it's not really, it's neither of those that are leading, it's really the like developed Europe. I mean, that's not, it, it's been a long time since anyone's talked about developed Europe leading global equities, but that's what's happening right now. Um, you know, it, some of it's country level things, some of it's sector level exposure that you get, whatever yeah. the reason you're seeing leadership out of Europe. Um, I think for investors, don't be afraid of that and kind of em embrace the strength where you see it. Yeah, the phrase European banks look good came out of my mouth in the last couple of months, which is <laughs> that, that was a little unusual because it's not been the case, right, for quite some time. But, but you're right. I mean, like, look at France, Germany, UK, yeah. uh, even Italy, Spain. A lot of these have had these really nice rotations in a way that we haven't seen as much in the US. Can we pivot a bit, um, uh, Willie, and just think about the Fed? So we've got the Fed coming up yeah. next week. You were actually on my show. I looked it up uh, last March when we were just getting started. This was like, the Fed just beginning this long, painful process that sort of yeah. took uh, much of last year. Now that we're checking in, you know, a little bit later here, what do you see when you're looking forward to next week? How much of an issue do you see that? And are you looking for any particular insights or signals related to the Fed meeting that investors should be looking for? Yeah, I, I think the the biggest issue with the Fed right now that I see, um, aside from the you know the 400 basis points of tightening that's kind of in the pipeline that I don't think has been fully reckoned with yet is that the, the Fed expects the Fed funds rate to be 75 basis points higher than the market does at the end of this year. That's a, for me, that's a pretty big disconnect. Um, they're saying we're going to, we're going to hike in, in, you know, probably 25 basis points in February plus two more hikes. The market's saying maybe you'll get two, may, maybe two more total, and then you're going to start to take it away. I, I think the messaging is what's really important now that this idea of they're going they're going to hike and then persist with high rates, not automatically pivot um, uh, to lower rates later this year. And, you know, ultimately, I think it comes down to inflation and how fast inflation comes down. I think they're 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 going to be timid and want to be sure that they see that trend turn, and not just in the CPI, but in some of these central tendency measures as well. So. Um, I don't think they'll surprise the market in terms of the, the tightening, but I think the the answers that Powell gives afterwards could could kind of lay the groundwork for where they're going for the rest of this, the first half of this year and then and into year end. Certainly seems like a bit of a disconnect between what the Fed is talking about, that terminal rate and and just the, ex the euphoria, I would argue we're seeing with, <laughs> yeah. with, uh, with individual stocks. Hey, listen, Willie, it's awesome to catch up with you. Thanks for coming on the show and uh, sharing some charts with us. Be well there in the uh, upper Midwest. We'll talk to you again soon, all right? Yeah, thanks a lot, Dave. Thanks for having me on. That's Willie Delwich. Willie's an investment strategist at All Star Charts, long time with uh, Robert W. Barrett. And just a, just a great, I mean, what, what a super nice guy, but a really good, thoughtful perspective about the overall market conditions. I like that, you know, at, at the end there, I'm glad we talked a, just a little bit about the Fed. And I think that's, for me, it's still very much a question mark. I feel like there's no question mark in terms of what the market seems to be pricing. And there's a certainty that we're obviously near the end. There's the light at the end of the tunnel. It seems to be wrapping up very quickly. 
That's not the feeling that you necessarily get from the Fed. And I was talking with Tony Dwyer, I think it was last week, about don't fight the Fed versus don't fight the tape. And we might be in that situation where you're getting mixed messages. And in, in general, I don't find the market likes mixed messages. doesn't like uncertainty as much as we like certainty, but we will do what, do what we can with the hand that's uh, dealt to us. Great take there, as always, from uh, Willie Delwich at All Star Charts. We need to wrap our show, folks, and go to the three and three. Let's talk about three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. This is one that I simply call the chart. I was talking again, I mentioned uh, in a, a webcast earlier today, and we were talking about just different measures of price, breadth, and sentiment that I review as part of my morning coffee routine. And uh, we did not focus on this particular chart, but this summarized some of the takeaways as I go through these charts every morning with a cup of coffee and think about what's happening and, and try to gather all the information I can using the technical toolkit, a chart like this, it's hard to deny the rotation that we've seen from pretty negative to fairly positive. And if you look at September to October, we had the S&P making a new 52-week low. We had the advanced decline line making a new 52-week low. We had about 4%, if not a little less, of the S&P 500 members above their 50-day moving average. Almost everything was below it. Pretty much uh, all down to 90% uh, of the S&P charts were in a bearish point and figure signal. And the uh, offense versus defense ratio was languishing, right? No real signal, sort of neutral on an equal weighted basis. Look at where we're at now. The S&P now arguably breaking this trend line. I think on a closing basis, certainly seems like we're uh, we're doing it here if we can get the follow through through the uh, the remainder of this week. But that's starting to look more constructive after the higher low around 3,800. The advanced decline line on all cap tiers that I look at already made it to uh, to a new swing high for the cycle here, breaking above the December high. We have about 70% of the S&P members above their 50-day. That's a firmly uh, bullish sort of range and not excessive. It's not over 90% or anything like that. You have about 66% of the S&P with a bullish point and figure chart. That's two out of three. And again, that's strong, but not too strong. That's not telling you there's euphoria. That's telling you there's overall constructive patterns. And the ratio of offense versus defense has, made, has broken out. So while those the market could certainly go down with this as the setup, but I would find it much more uh, easy to believe that the market goes higher from here with these measures of price and breadth and sentiment all pointing uh, thumbs up at the moment. Digging a little deeper into this ratio of offense versus defense during the market recap, we talked about this idea of things you want over things you need. And for me, the equal weighted version is one of the best measures. I was talking with Tom Boley uh, recently. We had another great discussion about just cap weighted versus equal weighted. And, and he makes a great point about focusing on some of the big names like Amazon and Tesla. And I 100% agree with that thought. I like looking at the equal weighted version to think about whether uh, on in general, right, more of a generality, are we rotating to things we want over things you need? And this ratio has broken out in a way that we've not seen since the third, fourth quarter of 2021. Last chart, Thermo Fisher Scientific TMO Healthcare was one of the worst performing sectors today. It was down a little bit while the market was sort of choppy flat. Some sectors up, some sectors down. Healthcare was not one of the better places. We talked about the weakness in some of the healthcare names recently. TMO is uh, splashing as a uh, as a bearish engulfing pattern. Now, again, with all candle patterns today, I'm having a little bit of question just to make sure it's not some artificial thing that we're seeing. I think TMO actually uh, was not affected, but I may be wrong. I'm, I'm not sure because we're still trying to piece together what happened this morning. But anytime you have a higher open and a lower close that engulfs the first day's body, that's called a bearish outside day if you're looking at bar charts or a bearish engulfing pattern on this chart right here. And that overall suggest short-term weakness versus short-term strength. Getting above 610 would alleviate that, but overall, TMO appears to be exhausted to the upside using that candle methodology. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close. Special thank you to Willie Delwich joining us from All Star Charts in Milwaukee. All of our previous interviews are at stockchartstv.com. And for Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, be safe. We'll see you tomorrow. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.